I'm like, bro. Does he, he got a kid? Look at his back. Oh my god. <laughs> Conversation Jordan Peterson to uh, Ben Shapiro. Yeah, these two having a conversation. Uh, I want to see how this goes. Is that like a referee in the middle? I don't know. Who that, I think it's another conservative like, thinker. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen him somewhere. But I've I seen him interview Jordan Peterson before. You got to react to some of his videos. Okay. Yeah. Uh, y'all enjoy any Jordan Peterson reactions? Two of our most viewed videos are from Jordan Peterson, man. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Appreciate that support. Keep watching. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and share. We're the 10K subscribers. Been all on YouTube video. So another question about Judaism. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, so one of the things that I would, that I've always wondered about is, I think one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from Judaism is that Judaism has an implicit emphasis on the salvation, on the sal on the salvific properties of the state, and I don't think you see that in Christianity to the same degree. So, I mean, because so there's, there's that well, there, yeah. well, there's the, there's the idea of Israel, no, this is, this that, is, that's is, part of it, yeah. and, and there's the idea of the Jewish nation as a people, mm -hmm. right, whereas Christianity has this universalism that's right. is it, built is, into it, this is right. right, and so, and this, is so a this is a fundamental distinction. Okay, so, okay, so, yeah. so, and this is, I've never been able to have this conversation with anyone, because it's an unbelievably dangerous conversation, but it seems to me that, it seems to me that the advantage of Christianity is that it places the fundamental locale for salvation within the individual. I mean, independently mm -hmm. of whether it's, like, pushed off for reasons of mercy onto Christ, right. which is something else we didn't finish discussing, is one of Jung's points with regards to Christianity and Catholicism was that, that there was a merciful element to it because the burden that was placed on each person being the locus of of redemption, let's say, was so heavy that it was unbearable. Right. And so that you needed an intermediary structure to, like, lift the load off you from time mm -hmm. to time, which is what the Catholics do. It's like, well, here's all the ways that I've failed. That's okay. You're fallible. You're a fallible human being. You don't have to be crushed into absolute dust by the fact that you're not everything you should be. So, all right, but anyways... The, I think that's where the, Jewish guilt kicks in, if I'm not mistaken. Well, and it's also, I think, to some degree where Protestant guilt kicks in because the Catholics have that out. Right. And you can be cynical about that, right? Say, well, you sin your whole life and then on your deathbed you're converted. It's like, well, that's all nonsense because you actually have to repent. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a lifetime of sin, there's going to be a whole <laughs> bit of hell <laughs> associated. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's up. right. But you can see the mercy in that, in, that, in that Catholic approach because it gives you like a reset in some sense, right? You get to be washed the fact that you're not everything you could be is a terrible burden. Right. And if you're carrying that all the time, it can just crush you into nothing. And, and, and obviously, that's that's present in its earlier iteration in the in the sacrificial system in the temple among Jews uh, or among the. I mean, like I say, in uh, three times a day, you say a portion in the Shemot Nasser, in the silent prayer, uh, in which you repent your sins, mm -hmm. and then we have a full day, right? Yom Kippur is deliberately designed to do that and to try and wipe the slate clean. And right, right, start. right, um, right. But right. as far as the the other question that you're asking, yeah, about the state, the, the individual, right? So it, to me, it's less about the state per se, because when you're talking about the nation of Israel, Am Yisrael in the in the actual biblical parlance, it's not talking about like a bordered state and incorporate salvation within that. It's about the special responsibility of this group of people to to spread light to the world, right? That you're supposed to be in the, again, Hebrew phrase, and you're using a lot of Hebrew today, but we're talking Bible, so we're yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, is that you're supposed to be a mamlechet kohan begoy kadosh, meaning that you're supposed to be a nation of priests um, and, and a holy nation. Uh, and so that idea uh, was expanded by Christianity to all of hum all of humanity corporately. That, that basically right. this, this applies equally to all humans. Now, what's interesting about Judaism is that Judaism actually has almost a two-track approach. So if you are a Jew then you have these responsibilities, these 613 mitzvot. You are not barred from the afterlife or from decency if you're not a Jew. So Judaism is only half exclusive in the sense that if you're a Jew, you're a Jew, and if you're not a Jew, we try to actually dissuade you from becoming one. But if you are, a, but if you are outside the Jewish nation, you have a share in the afterlife so long as you fulfill seven basic commandments, the commandments of Noah, Right, so there's a set of seven commandments that were given to Noah. These are basic, basic things. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't eat the flesh of a living animal, uh, don't, you have to create courts of justice. Uh, th these are like all very, very basic laws. And so what that means is that 
Judaism posits that Yom Hazoni is a really interesting philosopher from Israel. He has a new book out called The Case for Nationalism. Oh, yeah, essentially, really good yeah it's, really, mm. it's really interesting. Mm. And basically the case that he makes is that the biblical Jewish view of where values should be embedded at the maximal level is a safer view than the universalist conception. Because the universalist conception, that you have a set of values that applies equally to everyone across all times and cultures, actually leads to tyranny and cram downs. Meaning that his argument is that the threat of the 20th century was not a bunch of nationalisms that were embedding particular values. It was certain nationalisms that wanted to become universalisms. It was Germany wanting to be the Reich that ruled the entire world. Or the USSR wanting to be a country that was able to apply communism across all times and all places. So a certain level of particularism in how we apply basic rules, the seven laws of Noah in the biblical case or the Ten Commandments, you can have certain cultural differentiations and that allows for group cohesion mm -hmm. and in a way that you can't with the great mass of humanity. Right. Well, that's the Tower of Babel problem, right? right. Because it, if you expand the, if you expand it, the corpus exactly right. to, to be too large, then it starts to become too complex in exactly. structure and too totalitarian. Exactly. Right. So, so the so Jewish critique of, of the universalistic principle would be, yes, there are certain fundamental universal principles that we should all hold by, and those we hold have to get by Jews and non-Jews alike, but how those are iterated they have to be iterated within a specific cultural structure. Otherwise, what you end up with is people trying to cram down cultural hallmarks of those structures on everybody else. And totalitarianism springs from the idea that I'm going to take my culture, which is different, not actually better, right? Like, we don't actually say that the 613 commandments are necessary for everyone. They're they are not necessary for people who are not Jewish. And to take that and say, okay, now everyone has to abide by those things, would be a form of totalitarianism okay. Okay. in a so, way that, that okay. it is not when you say we have this particular set of values that is iterated to us in a particular way. Okay, but maybe we could maybe we could think about it this way. Maybe that would include both sides, is that there's a danger to claims of universalism, and that's that large-scale totalitarian mm -hmm. utopianism. And maybe you could you could criticize the universalism of Christianity as contributing to that from a conceptual perspective. But maybe you could say the same thing about the concentration on the particular on the side of the uh, of the Jewish emphasis on on the state, and that because there are obviously pathologies of ethno nationalism and localization that, sure. that also manifest themselves as another kind of danger. Right? It would be the danger of too much exclusion and the danger of not Come enough exclusion. exclusion. Right. Manifested after their people get annihilated in World War Two. You think about the line, well. Jews were facing uh, anti-Semitic anti behaviors in Europe since the Middle Ages. Actually, since classical periods when the Romans were around. When the the, the Jewish revolt happened, they, the Romans completely annihilated Judea, the Judea province. And they, uh, I think they, like, enslaved most of the Jews and then, like, they, like, they scattered the population throughout the Roman Empire. So that's why you had, like, all these Jews throughout Europe and all that. And so the issue is how you get the relationship between the individual be and the correct. Per per correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is one of the things that I think the EU is really struggling with is because, you know, I'm kind of, oddly enough, for someone who's a universalist, let's say, I'm somewhat um, sympathetic to the claims of the nationalists in the European Union because it seems to me that what they're complaining about is that as sovereign individuals, there have been <laughs> levels of bureaucracy laid out in this huge overarching structure, the EU, that divorce them as individuals from mm -hmm. their masters, mm -hmm. right? And they want a local structure so that they have some relationship with the structure. Right. And maybe you see in a place... And like, localism, by the way, with other human beings. I mean, the fact right. is that it, you, if you didn't value your own child more than you value the child of a stranger... This would probably make you a bad person, right? Right, like we would actually right, it would, consider it you would. a bad person. Like if, yes, if, if you had the choice between saving, if I had the choice between saving my son and saving a random kid of the same age, and I said, you know, I don't see any difference between yeah. these two things. Right, this would make me a bad person. So the idea of having societal bonds that are local in nature is one of the things that America got right in in its original yes. federal structure. Is the idea of localism. Localism is very important as opposed to one set of rules for everybody because we do have these variations, and those variations allow us to have the social fabric that's necessary. You can't. Yes. This is actually where. I mean, to bring it full circle back to the online stuff, the online 
world is a giant savanna. It is just one huge plane, right? There's no hierarchy in the online world. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there are no pockets in the online world on Twitter. It's just one huge plane. That doesn't generate any feeling of community. What generates a feeling of community is people who you actually have social ties with. And those social mm -hmm. ties are necessary. Social fabric cannot exist for six billion or seven billion human beings. Social That's fabric exists in your community, mm -hmm. right? And as large as that community can grow, and there are limits to the growth of that them. community. And maybe this is what both Christianity and Judaism have in common when it talks about the Messianic era, is there will be a time when that social fabric can, in fact, encompass everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, conformity, it's always been a thing. Yeah, of course, but... Uh, People just jump on bandwagons, especially with social media happening. You know, group of people are, are agreeing with just one thing. Yeah, just people just agree on stupid things. Like a freaking, like that Storm yeah. Area 51. Oh, yeah, like people thought they were going to be able to storm Area 51 that's in the middle of nowhere. And it's like no accessible airports to it, but you have to get... You know, like, you gotta like walk through the freaking like planes and stuff. You, you have to get Mountains. on an airport to a city that's like a couple miles away from the town that's located a couple miles away from where the base is actually at. <laughs> but to get to the base, you gotta pass like four layers of like rock. Not not rock, but like fence uh, uh, borders and stuff like that. But between that's the still, like, between desert. the fences, just like miles of desert, so it's like pointless. <laughs> so I don't understand. You know, some people still went. Yeah, they went, but they like barbecued at like the gas station where they saw people with these apparently seen aliens at this gas station. But yeah, if you enjoyed the reaction, make sure to like, my subscribe, and share. It's a ten, it's a road to ten k subscribers. See next time, peace. peace. I don't know.